All right, so the doors are open, Dale. Um, it's great seeing you again. Yo, great to see you, and thank you for the invitation. Well, thanks for taking the invitation, Dale. Um, you know, it's it's interesting uh, our relationship how it's uh, started kind of in the in the speaker circuit, and you know, as we started seeing each other more and more, uh, we developed this really good professional relationship that. Um, turning it into into I think a, a professional friendship so it's it's great having you here um you know as 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 always and for the people in the audience we are always trying to bring great speakers for us it's all about bringing like great thought leaders people are gonna really help our audience to get better at their job very simple as simple as that uh, is like we would like to create that kind of content we like our clients to create that kind of content and these webinars are a great way to create that kind of content and just give more to our audience and you know help them with their job. So thanks for coming, Dale. Um, so today we have marketing the age of AI. Of course, this is a topic that is being covered um everywhere and you know every conference that you go, you you will see AI as a main topic, but is is evolving really really quick. So it's good to you know keep refreshing ourselves and keep sharing our latest findings with our audience. So like I was mentioning, Dale is is a thought leader in SEO and content marketing, and he is a um, frequent speaker um, in inbound, at inbound content marketing world, Brighton SEO, to name a few, some of the most prominent uh, conference in our industry. So we are lucky to have Dale here. He's also the CEO and founder of Fire and Spark. Fire and Spark is an SEO agency out of Boston, a boutique agency, and uh, also interesting fact about Dale, he studied AI in a school. So uh, not only uh, he learned from experience in the last few months and whatnot, he actually has the credentials to speak about AI. So welcome Dale again, and thanks for, for joining us today. Awesome, yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm going to get started here. So there's been a lot of talk about AI. Everybody's talking about AI, just like uh, Carlos had said, every webinar, every conference. And what I like to do is to talk about practical use cases of AI. So how we're using uh, marketing uh, AI at our agency, and then also um, all of the examples and recommendations that I'm going to make today are things that you could be doing uh, with existing tools. So we're not talking about way into the future or anything like that. So let's get started here. Hi, once again, my name is Dale Bertrand. <laughs> so why do we care about AI? Because AI is really gonna affect marketers first. Um, and especially marketers that are dealing with content, producing content. And this is just the beginning. We're in the first inning of the impact that AI is going to have on marketing. And the workflows that we are, we're all used to, the way that we do what we do as marketers is going to need to change. So it's not just adding an AI tool that does what we do now better, but it can. it's really going to change how we get our work done. So all of us as marketers are going to have to learn new skills. And the way that I see this playing out is that human marketers will be responsible for the creative aspects of the job, for ideation, and then the AI tools will be responsible for applying and amplifying that uh, creativity and inspiration coming from the humans across multiple channels. So if we think about that, that's a good framework for how we can apply AI tools to what we do day to day as marketers. So um, Carlos already introduced me. I have, I have a technical background. I also work in marketing. So I've been combining those two things. I studied AI in grad school, built a supercomputer for the NSA. That is a story best told over a beer. And I run uh, Fire and Spark. We're an SEO agency. We only do SEO. We focus on SEO strategy um, so that we don't claim to be world-class in anything other than SEO. And we've worked with a bunch of clients, as you might expect, some of which you may have heard of. So now I'm going to talk about predictive and generative AI. So not too much background here at all. I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about use cases. But quickly here, uh, predictive AI, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I was looking at this patent filed by Amazon. It's a patent for anticipatory shipping. What that means is they're going to send you a box to your house with a bunch of stuff in it. And you get to decide what you keep and you send back the stuff that you don't want and you don't have to pay for the stuff that you don't want. In order for them to get this right so that you keep more than you send back, they need to use predictive AI. 
And in this case, the predictive AI is using all of the data around what I've purchased from Amazon in the past, my age, maybe what I say to Alexa, um, and then what I've returned in the past and what I've kept in the past to figure out what to send me. This is a very interesting predictive AI problem. And other examples are like um, using AI or AI that predicts Netflix, um, makes your Netflix recommendations, or AI that uh, predicts the stock market, or AI that predicts what you're looking for so that Google can populate its search results page. These are all examples of predictive AI. Now on to generative AI. The example I'm showing here is a headshot maker. Uh, if you haven't used one of these tools, they're great for social media. I have one on my LinkedIn. And what it is, is you give it a bunch of pictures of yourself and it creates a bunch of AI driven or AI produced uh, generative AI um, images that you can choose from and use. So this is one of many, many examples of generative AI, but you can use, gener you can use AI uh, to generate and manipulate images and text and audio and video. It's really crazy, but wait, there's more. So the more when it comes to generative AI is really, people don't realize it can generate programming code or PowerPoint presentations or entire websites. I saw a demo just today of a tool where you describe the new website that you want to the tool. And it gives you a wireframe that you can manipulate and hand off to your designer and your developer. I'm going to start using that tool tomorrow because it's going to save us a bunch of time anytime we create um, a, a, a web page or a new website for an event or anything like that. Um, but generative AI can do more than just generate blog posts, people. And that's what I want people to understand because there are hundreds of different types of content that we're going to use generative AI to create. Now, other examples like using it to create content brief or design computer hardware, which is what I did in grad school, um, another story best told over a beer, or to summarize web analytics, and these are, these are all generative AI tasks. Now, as marketers, we're going to quickly, up or in 2024, we're going to be updating our marketing tech stacks. Um, there's a lot of information on here, but what it comes down to is AI is just smarter software. We're going to have access to smarter software as marketers, uh, prediction engines, generative AI tools. Um, they're tools that are going to give us analytics insights automatically. We can build apps that we use for our workflows without coding. And we'll have easy access to data analytics, data that we might decide to use in our content or data that we're just using to, to do performance analysis. And then we can share these workflows when we create them in, in AI, like the custom GPTs that you can build in chat GPT plus right now. And then the last piece on here is automated agents, which I love. If you think about something like Google alerts, if you've ever used it, I do a lot of uh, conference speaking. So I have a Google alert that will tell me anytime a conference puts out a page that says uh, submit to speak or something like that. That's an autonomous agent. It runs in the background. And we're going to create a lot of these from prompts and other tools that do all kinds of monitoring, tracking um, things for us, like monitoring our competitors' prices or keeping track of one of our best customers' LinkedIn profiles or, or anything like that. Um, moving on here, large language models. I'm only going to have a couple of slides here on how they work. But what I want people to think about is if I were to ask you the question, what is one plus one? What is the answer you would give me? And I can't see very many of you, but I, I see one of you mouthing the answer two, which is awesome because you are correct. You passed my IQ test. Um, but the reason why I'm asking you this is when you gave me the answer two, were you actually doing math or were you just completing a pattern? And the way that we would normally think about this is one plus one equals two, that's a computational problem. But really when we answer this question, it's a pattern that we know. We know that when we hear one plus one, the answer is two. Now, when large language models are trained on pretty much everything that's ever been written on the web, they're identifying patterns, lots and lots of patterns. And when we're using them to generate a data analysis or a blog post, whatever it is, they're using all of those patterns to do the work for us. And ultimately what they're doing is they're predicting the next word. So if they're writing a sentence, my feet got wet while crossing the, they, they assign a probability to all the words that might come next, maybe river, maybe street, maybe puddle, maybe swamp, but with some randomness, they'll give you a high probability word that comes next. So that's how the large language models are working or how they work when they're generating text. 
Now, one of the things I like people to understand is that a large language model like ChatGPT, it's not just good at generating text. It can do more than that. Um, for example, it can understand language. And this is the reason why I think of large language models like ChatGPT as tools for natural language problems. Now, they need to understand your prompts and they need to understand everything that um, they ingest during their training. Now, another thing that they can do is they can reason and they can reason based on pattern recognition and all those patterns that they learned during their training. And then the last piece is they can compose useful outputs. A lot of times we think of useful output or sorry, the output that we want from ChatGPT or, or a large language model to be text. For example, if we're generating a blog post, um, but they can generate code and tables and images and just mountains of different types of outputs that are useful. Now, this is my dog, um, Ginger. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Now, she's a beautiful dog. She's cute, but she's also pretty evil. One day um, in the morning, I, I came downstairs and I found that she had made a huge mess and dragged all of her wet food across the rug and caused a big mess. And my wife saw it and I told her, don't worry, I'm going to clean it. I got this. No problem. Now, what happened was I got on my knees and I was scrubbing, trying to get the stain out of the rug. I realized that I wasn't going to be able to get the stain out. So I needed a machine that was purpose built to clean up after mutts like this. And so what I did was I turned to my Alexa device and I said, Alexa, order a wet vac. But unfortunately for me, what I learned the hard way was that when you say Alexa, order a wet vac, it sounds a lot like Alexa, order eight wet facts. So this was a huge fail for me. And not only was I having a bad day, but when I tried to return them to the Amazon store, this guy could not figure out how to return all of these wet bags. Now, why am I telling you that story as a part of this AI webinar? Uh, because there are problems with large language models. They can get it wrong and you don't want to use them in a life or death situation. That's obvious. But when we're writing marketing content, there are going to be inaccuracies. Um, getting the prompt right so that we can do the right thing is difficult. Um, there are issues around how we compensate the publishers that are writing all this content that, that it was trained on. And then we need to protect our IP. So if you work at a company that has some internal strategies or maybe you work in an agency and you have your client's data, you have to be very careful what AI you give it to and make sure the AI is protecting the data that you give it. Now, I found this very interesting. MIT did a study around um, how office workers, these are college trained office workers, are will use AI. And what they did was they took uh, 444 college educated professionals. Half of them were allowed to use ChatGPT and half of them were not. And they were completing tasks like writing emails, writing reports, the types of things that we do as college educated um, professionals during our workday. And what they found was that the professionals that were allowed to use ChatGPT, they got the work done faster, but not only did they get the work done faster, but they were able to do it at the same level of quality. And what was most interesting about it, and in this diagram, you can see um, the gray over on the left is the professionals that did not use ChatGPT. They spent more of their time writing and, and brainstorming uh, compared to if they had ChatGPT, they were spending less of their time doing brainstorming and, and rough drafting and writing and more of their time editing. And I think this is really important because for those of us as, uh, who are working as marketers, especially if you're working on content, the workflows that we are going to create that you can take best advantage of AI tools are going to be workflows where the AI is creating the rough draft and the AI is helping us do our brainstorming ideation and research. And we as humans are spending more and more time editing the rough drafts that the AI is giving us. Um, and it's not just blog posts. It might be PowerPoint presentations or a number of different things. Now, this is a survey by um, Jasper AI. If you're just getting started with using AI for marketing work, um, this was interesting. And this is where I would suggest that you get started. What they did was they surveyed all of their users on the Jasper AI platform and asked them how they were using AI for marketing. So I highly recommend getting started by improving existing content, generating new ideas, building content outlines. It's a good place to start. Uh, with AI. Now, 
I love to think of AI as a thought partner. And I'm going to show you now some use cases, how I'm using AI in day-to-day -day work and how our team at Fire and Spark is using AI. Um, use it to do research, use it to improve your ideas, use it to analyze data, use it to write rough drafts of pretty much everything, including emails and content and presentations. Um, and we are going to go through, here's one example. Now, one thing that we did at my agency is we recorded all of our sales calls for the last two years. So we have two years worth of audio recorded sales calls. So what that allowed us to do was to pass those audio files to um, a transcription tool, an AI transcription tool, and then ask it to extract all of the questions that people asked us on sales calls. And not only that, but we asked it to categorize those questions by the stage of the sales pipeline that they were in when we had those conversations. So what that allowed us to do was to automatically take this data set of audio recordings of all of our sales calls for the last two years and look at the questions that people were asking us and make sure that we're covering those questions in our marketing materials, in our proposals, all of that sort of thing. So that was a hugely useful use case for us for, um, for AI. Now, another example here using ChatGPT for ideation. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm telling in the prompt, I'm telling ChatGPT about a project that we're working on with a financial institution where we're writing some web content related to a donor advised fund for charitable giving and asking it to generate some examples of calls to action that we might put on that page um, or in that article that we're writing. And you can see that it's giving us a number of different ideas. They're even better because we gave it examples. And what you will find using a tool like ChatGPT is that you get much better outputs when you give it examples. So this is a, a great example of like AI and human working together um, to, to basically generate more ideas, um, more possibilities for the calls to action. Now, here's another use case for using AI as an ideation partner. Here, what we were doing is we were working with a client that sells a pet product. So they sell it into the pet industry to dog owners. Um, and basically, it's something to be used for dog training. So the first step here was to ask ChatGPT, what are two well-known dog training experts? And then basically, it gave me two of them, uh, Caesar and Victoria. And then I took Caesar and Victoria and I said, great. And I asked ChatGPT to write me an interview where they are being interviewed. And they're being asked about static correction. And static correction is when you shock a dog when they get too close to a, an invisible fence or something like that. And focus on the areas where these two well-known dog training experts disagree. And what was wonderful about this prompt is it gives me a whole interview written out. Um, and it, it's a fake interview, obviously. But based on what ChatGPT knows about these two dog training experts, I, one of them was saying static correction is wrong, it's inhumane and it's unnecessary. And then the other one was saying, yeah, but dogs, it's, it's a, still a good idea if you're keeping the dog out of harm's way. And then also remember that dogs are pack animals and they're used to having an alpha dog in the pack. And it's very interesting. There's just a number of ideas if I was working on content uh, related to this topic. And you can do this sort of thing with any type of content. Um, asking ChatGPT to, find, to to give you two experts and then write an interview. Now, what it comes down to for writing tasks is in the future, or well, now even now using AI, we expect humans to write to process their thoughts and then also write to craft stories and connect concepts. And also you as human marketers will do writing to simplify concepts, so make them easier for your readers to understand. Now, what the AI is going to be good for when it comes to writing is transforming these ideas into just words on the page. You might give it bullet points, it might give you a paragraph. And then also drafting outlines and rough drafts. And, and of course, we still need humans to do the editing. And then analyzing and summarizing research materials or transcripts of phone calls or dictation like I do. That's what the AI will be good at. But we still need human marketers, still need human writers. Now, 
now I'm talking here about email list segmentation. Now, this was an interesting prompt. I said, what is Lindsay Christensen's job title at ThoughtBot? Um, and she's the chief product officer. Um, the reason why I was doing this is because we had an email list and the email list has thousands of people on it. And for each person in that list, we know um, we know where they work, we know their name, we know their email. And I was trying to figure out how do we segment it. And I wanted to segment it by business owners and then another list for agency owners and another list for everybody else. So I wrote some prompts that would uh, figure out what everybody's title is in order for me to do that. So this is basically using um, Google's Gemini Pro large language model, which is very similar to ChatGPT to do email list segmentation based on people's job titles. Now, I, I wanted to pause here. I'm going to talk next about data analysis. But if you want my slides, email me. If you have any questions, email me. This is my email address. Jot it down. Um, and I'll, I'll send you the slides. And then also, I have a bunch of prompts uh, related to the examples that I'm about to show you. So you can uh, write this down. Send me a quick email to get those to get those prompts. Now, quick, when it comes to the yeah, data, a question. Uh, yeah. There, so just to not interrupt your flow too much. So I, I've gotten a few questions about tools that you have used, like um, like the tool that you use for uh, I think for ideation, and I think also a tool for web building. Um, we can send it later with uh with slides or just at the end we can cover with questions. But just kind of wanted to. Yeah. Put that so usually I'm using a ChatGPT Plus account. We now have a Teams account, which is really important, and they just came out with that a week ago. But the reason why the Teams account is so important is because OpenAI won't use the information you give it to train its model. And you don't want your proprietary information trained into their model. Um, you The Teams account is like 30 bucks a month or $25 a month if you pay annually. It's very, very worth it. Um, honestly, if your employer won't pay for it, I would pay for it on my own. Um, and then in terms of the website to make wire wireframes, it's called Reloom dot io um r-e-l-u-m-e -E dot io if you don't find it email me i can i can send that to you thanks yeah uh, so then for data analysis um quick story here we had a client that lost a whole bunch of traffic and what we were able to do was to look at the month before they lost a whole bunch of traffic and a month after they lost a whole bunch of traffic and Basically, what we did was we were we grabbed the data from the month before and the month after from Search Console so that we could understand why they were losing so much organic traffic. And what we did was we uploaded that data to a chat GPT plus um, account and then prompted it to ask to look at the pages that lost organic traffic and the keywords that were driving traffic to those pages that lost organic traffic to figure out what types of topics they were losing traffic for. And what's super interesting is this particular client was selling wool products. So wool products like wool insulation, and they were selling a lot of the wool insulation into houses and then also into vans. So there are a lot of people that live out of their vans and they want wool insulation so they could stay warm. It's called van life for anybody who wants to know. And what, what ChatGPT told us, I mean, normally this would take me hours to, to sift through um, a massive website with almost half a million um, uh, visits a month. But what it told us was that they still had traffic for keywords related to wool insulation for houses, but they had lost most of their traffic for wool insulation related to van life, which I thought was really interesting. And we were, uh, we were able to, um, to work on that. Now, um, another example here, now this is Claude, so Claude.ai. It's a large language model, very similar to ChatGPT. I believe that Claude is better for writing. So I use Claude for writing and I use my ChatGPT account when I'm asking it to do, um, doing research or asking it to do reasoning or automating a process or something like that. Now this screenshot is Claude. And what I did is I have a client that sells computer chips and they have these PDF data sheets for every computer chip with a ton of technical details. I gave it 
four of these PDF data sheets for four of the devices that they sell. And I asked it to give me a table comparing the devices. And it was able to create that table. Now you can imagine um, giving it more than four, or you could imagine um, asking it to draw a, a chart, a visual chart, or um, you could, once it creates the table, like I didn't tell it what, um, what comparisons I wanted it to make, you know, voltage versus resistance, all that. So you could have a conversation with it to improve the table to get exactly what you want, but it's it's hugely, hugely useful. Now inside ChatGPT, there's something called advanced data analytics. And this is what allows us to upload a spreadsheet and ask questions. If you're just getting started with a ChatGPT Plus account and you're using advanced data analytics, what I like to do is give it some data and ask it, how can you help me analyze this data? Or, or ask it, how can you help me visualize this data? And it will give you examples. Now, what I did here was I gave it some, some search term keyword data from a Google ads account. And I asked it to look at the con which of those search terms had converted and to give me some, some categories of keywords that were converting really well. And then I asked it to give me high level categories of keywords that weren't converting very well. Um, and it's super helpful for, for something like that, especially with keyword data. Now, once again, this is also in ChatGPT Plus account using GPT-4 and advanced data analytics. Now what I'm giving it is some marketing data from my agency in a spreadsheet. And it shows the number of leads that we generated from the marketing activities that my agency does. And I asked it to compare or do a month by month comparison of the leads that my, gener my agency generated for our services um, and comparing 2022 to 2023, and it's freaking awesome. Um, and you can do the same type of thing in um, Excel, so don't get me wrong. But what's nice about this is you can have a conversation with it. Now, Excel will also have Microsoft's co-pilots that will allow you to, to do this sort of thing. So I, last thing I want to mention around using AI for data analytics for content is that you can find useful data in a lot of different places. Like we all know that data-driven content does better than generic content for a lot of reasons. Now you can look for data to, in to include in your content from proprietary data, and it might be data generated by your business. I did a project for cars.com and we had a bunch of data around who was buying what type of car state by state in the US. And there's also public data. So this is stuff like government data, um, financial regulatory data, in, and there's a ton of that in real estate that's available, in insurance, financial services, um, nursing and healthcare. So you can find that data for free online because the government just it releases it. And then there's scraped data. You can imagine scraping Amazon reviews or pricing from competitor sites or Amazon or something like that um, to generate data. Um, back in the day, I worked on a project where we scraped nursing pass rate data. What that is, is you go to every nursing school in the US and then you look at what percentage of their graduates passed the nursing exam. And every, every nursing school has it on their website. We scraped it, put it together in a spreadsheet, and we were able to write about it. If we had AI tools, that would have been like a day's worth of work rather than, honestly, it took us two months to have somebody just grab all that data and put it together. Um, and then there's behavioral data that could come from your website analytics or search console or something like that. Then there's API data. So if you have access to a tool like SEM Rush for SEO, but there's a lot of other tools out there. Um, and then another thing I didn't mention is Appify, which is something I use, A-P-P-I-F-Y, which is a scraper marketplace where you can go there and then just type in the type of data that you want. And then they have a scraper in that marketplace that can get that data for you. So finding data, using AI to scrape it and process it um, will definitely improve your um, marketing content. Now let's talk about visuals. I'm sure everybody on this call has played around with Midjourney or Dali to, to create images for content. We all know that great content needs great visuals to help readers understand the information in the content. And now let's talk about how AI can help. Now, I already showed you guys how we were processing or using a ChatGPT Plus account with advanced data analytics enabled to generate a 
uh, table before it was month by month comparison of leads generated. What this is doing is I instead here, what I asked it to do was to create a chart that shows the source of those leads. Where did they come from? Did it come from one of my agency's partners or an event where I was speaking, something like that. Now, what I'm about to show you is what I usually do next because I love this. And oh, and this is this is the chart that it created, uh, qualified leads by source. Now, what I did with this chart was I uploaded it into Canva. And you can see here, there's a two second video here that plays. And what Canva has is Canva has this suite of AI tools that it calls Magic Studio. And it's fantastic. If you already have Canva, then you definitely need to look into and make sure you understand all of the tools that are in the Magic Studio. And this might be a reason to get Canva, honestly. But I'm going to show you one of the Magic Studio features inside Canva, which is Magic Text. And the way Magic Text works, watch this as I roll the video here. This is me clicking on edit photo after I uploaded the photo. Then I hit grab text, which is the magic text feature. What it's doing is it's taking the text in the image and turning them into editable text fields. And I love that because I can use a tool like ChatGPT to create a visual that has some text in it. And I do that in a lot of different ways, not just charts. Then I can bring that into Canva and edit the text, even though the tool that created it spit out an image. And, and I do that a bunch because it's, it's super useful. Now, when it comes to typography and text in images, I'm sure you guys have played around with Midjourney and Dali to create images and, and probably have a good idea how to get started there. But the problem I had was getting it to write good text because typography is hard to do in AI images. Now the left here, well, the prompt that I gave it is I said, generate a robot holding a sign that reads overlord in training. And the first image here on the left from Canva, it got the text totally wrong. So what I've been doing up until recently is using ideogram.ai. And the reason why I've been using ideogram.ai to generate um, marketing images is because it gets the text right. And I wanna get the text right well enough. Like I might use it like this. I might put it in Canva and use the magic text tool. Um, you can see that Dali did a good job and Midjourney V6 that just came out also does a good job when it comes to typography. Um, I don't know if I'll be using Ideogram as much anymore since the other tools are also pretty good at typography nowadays. This is an example of a blog article that I wrote about black backlinking where I, I had Ideogram generate an image for it. In the future, I want images on my blog posts to change automatically, dynamically. So instead of me putting a, a, a featured image in my WordPress blog post, I give it a prompt instead. And I can do stuff like change the way it looks or something like that and have it have that be automated. Um, but I, I will I will do that at some point. And this is just another example. No more stock photos. This is a friend of mine, Noel, that sent me uh, an email newsletter this morning, actually, and I took a screenshot and put it in the presentation. Um, but he's writing about he's trying to slow down because he's doing too much work. And um, I love the, the image that he generated for it because I've always hated stock photos in my marketing content because they always look like stock photos. Now, don't get me wrong, AI generated photos look like AI generated photos, but they're a lot better than stock photos when everybody's using the same stock photos in their marketing content. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some other useful AI tools that are useful for marketing. And there are tools that you can use today now, the first one is one I've already talked about, which is ChatGPT+. Plus. If you're using the free version of ChatGPT, you need to get either a Plus account or a Team account. It's worth it. Um, there's, there's so much that's available to you from custom GPTs to the GPT store, which we haven't even talked about yet, uh, but we will. Uh, there is a Chrome plugin that I love. It is called ChatHub. And what this does, you can see how I'm using it. I can type in one prompt and send it to six um, large language models all at the same time. One of them is, is Claude that we talked about. One is ChatGPT. But this has been great for me because it helped me to understand which large language model, which chatbot to use for different types of um, prompting that I'm doing for various different things. So I just happen to love Chat ChatHub right now. Um, and then there's also the GPT store. Now, if you have a ChatGPT Plus account already, you know that you can create your own uh, trained custom GPTs by giving it 
some information about whatever domain, like maybe content strategy or how to create an infographic, something like that. Um, I've used two uh, GPTs actually. Um, one is an infographic creator. The other one is a uh, helps you with your content strategy and they worked great. Uh, there's a lot of crap in the GPT store. So um, there's definitely a discoverability problem. But if you stick to the top GPTs that are getting upvoted um, and, and it does something that you're working on, you can find something reasonable and something usable. But you have to have a chat GPT plus account. It's another reason why I think a chat GPT plus account is a no brainer, even if your employer won't pay for it. Then there's GPT for Sheets. What this allows you to do is it adds a function to your Google Sheets. Now, you might have used functions in Google Sheets like sum this, average that, but when you have the GPT function in Google Sheets, you can pass it a prompt. And what it'll do is it will send that prompt to ChatGPT and then put the result right in your spreadsheet in that cell. What that allows you to do, like I have a client we're working with that um, builds custom homes and they have a lot of like hundreds of floor plans for different custom homes that they've built. So what we have in one column of the spreadsheet is links to all of the floor plans for the custom homes that they've built. And then, the, and then it will create a prompt based on those links. And then it will, at the, and what the prompt will do is it will write a description of that floor plan that they can use on their website. So you just basically drag this GPT function all the way down and you get the descriptions populated from chat GPT. And here's another example of using the chat, uh, sorry, the GPT function. Uh, this is one of the uses where I've used it personally. Now, remember, I run an SEO agency. We only do SEO. So I'm on the phone talking to people about SEO and SEO content all of the time. This prompting sheet, what it has is I can put some information in the cells up here about whoever I'm talking to. And the example here is I was talking to somebody um, who was looking to recruit um people in the trades for construction, like plumbers and, and um, carpenters and things like that. So based on that, it'll create a prompt, which is down here, and it'll pass that to the GPT function. And what the prompt is doing is coming up with content ideas that are what I call niche collection pages. And there's a lot of other content types in this spreadsheet, if you were to scroll down. And then the output is basically content ideas. So what this allows me to do is when I get on the phone with somebody and I'm talking to them about SEO content, I can put in some information at the top about their business and get a whole bunch of content ideas that might make sense to them. And I can have a conversation uh, with them about it and figure out what they might be most interested in. So now I'm going to talk about generative AI for search. Now, Google has been like the top dog in search for a very long time. And I run an SEO agency. So we've been optimizing for Google search for a very long time but things are a changing. And the reason why things are changing is because Google is um, incorporating a large language model into its search. So it'll basically combine what we're used to seeing when we do a Google search, which is a bunch of links to web pages with a large language model that can give you the searcher the answer or summarize whatever is on the page. So if you have gotten, if you've tried this before, it's Google's search generative experience. Um, if, if you have organic traffic, like you'll need to protect it because um, what search generative experience is doing for top of funnel informational keywords is giving you the answer or giving the searcher the answer. So if you're writing a lot of top of funnel content, um, Google might not need to send people to your website anymore. And when this comes out, it might affect your tra traffic. It might not because we don't know exactly how Google is going to implement this, if they're going to make it optional, if they're going to force people to use it. It's a big question mark, but it is something worth watching if you have existing organic traffic. Now, if you don't have existing traffic, then the way to think about this, and honestly, anybody should think about it this way, is when this change does come out, there will be new opportunities for new types of content, for new um, SEO strategies um, to, to basically get your website at the top of the results and get more traffic and all that good stuff. Um, another thing that we think is possible 
is that since people will be having a conversation with Google when they're looking for something, when you might end up getting less people coming to your website, but they will be much better qualified than they are now. We all know that the vast majority of traffic doesn't convert. In the future, uh, with Google search generative experience, we expect a higher percentage of that traffic to convert since it'll be such a much better search engine. So SEO strategies are likely to change. Um, SGE is going to answer questions directly. There'll be less links, as I said. There'll be different ranking factors. That means there are different things that we have to do to get traffic and get our content to rank. Um, I've already talked about how top of funnel informational uh, keyword traffic is really the most at risk. And, and also we found from our testing that Google's search generative experience, it, it interprets search intent differently. So remember, Google's always trying to figure out what are you searching for so that it can give you the right results. Um, but search generative experience tends to think you're looking for something different. Now, what this all boils down to is that in addition to SEO, there will be generative engine optimization, which we're calling GEO. And I find that I find that very interesting. Um, and I'll give you just kind of flavor of the experiments we're doing and what we're thinking around generative optimization. So when you're experimenting with generative engine optimization, one experiment that I did that I think would help everybody kind of understand what's going on is to, is to sign up for a search generative experience also experiment with a search engine out there called perplexity.ai, which is um, an AI search engine, very similar to the way Google will work when Google makes these changes. And type in a question related to something you know really well, like maybe your company, maybe you. What I did was I took my agency, Fire and Spark, and I, write, I wrote, what does Fire and Spark do? And then what I did was I looked at, well, what is Google search gen generative experience showing? And I could see, that it's giving information about my agency that is the average of everything that's ever been written on the web. And then also it's very peculiar to me and I'm starting to figure it out and understand what results it's showing um, compared to what would show up in the normal search results. And this is how we're starting to figure out how generative engine uh, optimization is gonna be different from search engine optimization. Um, we're, fi we're finding things like the more mentions you have of your brand, then um, the more likely you are to show up. And then citations in your content is important. High quality content is always important, but we all know that the definition of high quality content is constantly shifting. And then anything that you're doing to prove to Google that you're an authority in your space, in your market, whatever your niche is, um, will, still will still continue to be important. Now, um, here I'm showing just some of these, and I don't want to take up all of our time with this, but just showing some of the examples of like exactly what it was showing when I when I um, Googled what does Fire and Spark do in a search generative experience. And um, I, I was surprised. It was showing some very old articles. Um, but what you really want with LLMs, which is different from old school um, Google search, is you want the right information about whatever it is, your company, your products, or the the whatever domain you're writing about to be in as many places as possible. Because remember, large language models are averaging what's out there, what it's been trained on, as opposed to old school Google, which is trying to surface the best pages. Um, but at the end of the day, Google search generative experience will get better um, at finding the right information. So I already talked about some of our learnings, like brand mentions matter in order to get uh, shown in the new search generative experience, um, building authority in your market matters. And then you want to have comprehensive coverage of the content niche that you that you're writing about. Um, that means that you're answering all of the relevant questions that your buyers would have when they're making a buying decision. Uh, Google likes to see, and especially Google's AI likes to see that you're an expert in the space by the fact that you're covering the niche very closely. And then you're in, best in CRO and UX that matters. There are engagement signals that, um, that will be important. 
and then varying different content formats because a lot of what's going on with AI search engines is they're showing more than just web pages in the content. And then there's something interesting about Reddit content. Reddit, Google thinks that Reddit style content is special and valuable. Um, that's because it's firsthand experience. It's a real conversation. It's definitely not generated by um, an AI. So to the extent that you can generate content that's coming from firsthand experience, um, that's going to be important and it's gonna show up um, more often. So a couple more slides here, um, how we're thinking about SEO with all the changes that are coming is the old school SEO tactics used to be around SEO for rankings. Um, nowadays, what I call, I call it SEO for revenue, but instead of targeting just organic traffic and rankings, you really need a more holistic approach where your goal is to generate customers. And that's how you're going to do well um, with the new changes that are coming with Google SGE. And I'm going to I'm going to skip over this example to make sure that uh, we have time for some questions at the end here. Um, but one of the changes that we're making to the way that we do SEO, especially with generative search AI um, coming out, is that instead of the old school of way of doing SEO, where you might do keyword research and like a technical audit up front when you're working on our website, we'll start with the search intent and then use the search intent to filter the different types of keywords that we're going after. But even more important than that, um, up front, we're doing search intent and we're crafting the calls to action up front before we do keyword research, before we do an SEO technical audit. Because when you're creating SEO content, the purpose of the content is to drive people from the intent that you're targeting to the conversion point so you can get them to convert. This is why, or this is one of the things that changes when you're doing SEO, um, possibly for a, a large language model or a generative engine, um, and you're doing SEO for customer acquisition and conversions, not just for rankings and traffic, you really have to consider these conversion points up front. Um, and that that's a whole a whole nother a whole nother webinar. Um, and as I said, you need to align the intent that you're going after with the call to action that you put together. Um, last thing I'll say before we take questions, um, Google's SGE is coming out. There are risks and there are opportunities, which is awesome. Um, we have a risk and opportunity analysis that we're doing for our clients. We usually charge you know twenty five hundred bucks for it, but I have a a few that I could do for folks if anybody is interested, um, just to help you understand uh, how your organic traffic is going to change with uh, the traffic that you're getting now and the, the content that you have now as Google rolls out these changes over the course of 2024. So definitely hit me up um, if you would be interested in understanding that about your particular website. Um, my email is dale at fireandspark.com. Dale, fantastic job as usual. Um, yeah, your, your, your talks are always great, very insightful. And, you know, I, I love that you have very practical, tactical stuff, right? So you cover the strategy and kind of the high level stuff, but also some, some things that people can just walk away and go and apply, uh, right after this, um, webinar. So question that came a few times, so like some about tools. And I think maybe the, the easy way would be. Any recommended tools that you have that come to mind? You mentioned ChatGPT, Anthropic, Claude. Um, if there's anything else that you want to mention, anything, everything else, we can also kind of in the yeah. we're gonna start recording now with the slides, and maybe maybe we can include a list of, of recommended tools. But I don't know uh, any other tools that you want to recommend, Dale. Yeah, one more I'll recommend. Like we've gotten a lot of value out of recording conversations. It might be a sales conversation or an internal conversation or a webinar like this or me when I'm on stage or doing a workshop. And then taking that audio and transcribing mm -hmm. it and then running prompts against it. And one tool that's excellent for that is called Cast Magic. It was originally built for podcasts. That's why it's called Cast Magic. Um, but I I don't do a podcast. I mean, I use it for to, for all of my recordings. And what I have in Cast Magic is I have 20 prompts that will run against the audio that I give it. For example, I'll give it, I'll probably give it the audio of the conversation that we're having today. And when I give it that, that audio, there will be, there'll be 20 prompts. One of those prompts will ask for, you know, stories that I told so I can in include them 
in my content as like openings to content that I write, or a lot of times I use them as like a LinkedIn post. And then there'll be another prompt that will generate an outline for an article based on the audio that I just give it. And then uh, another prompt that will um, write an analogy. Like if I, if I talked about how you need to understand the difference between generative AI and, and predictive AI, it'll say, the difference between generative AI is, and predictive AI is like the difference between fire and, and water. Here's the thing. So it generates a lot of those. And sometimes there's one that I actually use, but it's it's really fun. Like I, I think of it as real time SEO content because I can, I have almost a complete automation where if I'm talking on the phone, like sales conversations or doing a webinar like this, then it will run those prompts automatically and I'll get some content or at least some outlines or content briefs in my email the, the following morning. And it's based on my ideas. It's not asking ChatGPT to write a blog post for you. It's just organizing my ideas in a way that they're more useful to me. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I love the um, audio structure trans transcription and whatnot. So we use Firefly's AI for all of our calls. And um, one of the features that they have, which I really like, is you can actually drop a different video recording or audio recording in the tool and it will transcribe it. So you don't have to record natively on, on uh, Fireflies. You can just also drop any video or audio file you have and it will transcribe for you, give you insights. So I think using your calls, um, you know, if you're doing calls with clients, there's so much intel there that you can extract. Okay, what are their more, most common pain points? I love your idea about your your um, your example about discovery calls, where you're kind yes. of uh, extracting those insights. So, uh, amazing tool. Dale, there is another um, question, and uh, Huda Sanchez is, um, or Sabrina Huda, I'm sorry, uh, is asking, how can I learn to write more effective prompts? Oh, that is awesome. So there, there's a number of structured prompt templates. So there's three ways that I would think about it. One is um, learning strategies, because I have one where you, you type in a role and then some instructions, then a style guide, then examples. It's like one, two, three, four. So there are a number of templates like that that are out there on the web that you can Google for. And, and that'll help you. And I'm sure I have some videos somewhere. Uh, feel free to email me because I can send you a video that I have on, on how I structure prompts. But then the second way to do it would be to use a prompt library. Like there's so many tools. There's AIPRM, which is one of them. Um, and then another tool, Chat Hub that I told you about, it has a bunch of prompts already in it that you can use. And then the third way, is there some tools that will help you improve your prompts? And, and that's built into some AI writers, but I would Google it because I don't know, remember the name of them, of any of them off the top of my head, but it's basically like a website you can go to, give it a prompt and press a button, and then it, it writes a better version of that prompt for you. And you'll that'll definitely help you realize or learn how to be more specific. But the one thing I'll say about writing better prompts is if you can give it examples in the prompt, like if I'm asking you to write t headlines for a blog post based on the content brief, if I gave it some examples of headlines that I like, it's always gonna do better than if I don't give it examples. So that that's one, and I'll give you one more tip if we have time, um, which is to give it a role. So if I if it's writing for my website, I'll say, you're a, an expert copywriter and an expert SEO marketer, uh, and then tell it what to do. And giving it a role like that is super important because what it does in the large language model or in ChatGPT is it activates everything that ChatGPT learned about those roles, what it learned about being an expert copywriter what it, when it was trained, and what it learned about um, SEO strategy when it was trained, when you give it that role. And that means it'll 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 give you better output for whatever you're asking it to do. But those those are two like quick tips. Yeah, no, that's that, that's awesome. Um, a lot of interest in in your your um, tactical advice. Some somebody's asking for a video, so I'm asking people um, for if you have an a specific you ask, email me. My email's up here. Yeah, um, it's up there. Um, yeah, just we, we have a few more minutes, and um, I j just would love to hear your take on this. Um, Neil Patel came the, the other day and published um, some statistics and some experiments that they found 
uh, looking at AI generated content. So they surveyed, I think uh, over a thousand people. Um, and what they found is only 12% of them are producing human written content, just purely human written content. The other 88 are producing using AI or a hybrid between humans and, and, and AI. And what they found is also that the top 1% of or that, or the top, no, the top performing pages, 94% are of the top performing pages are human written content. So I guess what, what he is saying, and they also run an experiment where um, human written content, we're getting 5X the results of AI written content. So lots to unpack there. Because uh, I think there are a lot of nuances. It's not as simple as human or AI and, and, and all those things. But uh, I just want to, I don't know if you have any reaction to that or any initial thoughts. Uh, and if you have yeah. seen this, these numbers. Yeah, the more you play around with using AI tools to help with content, whether it's the visuals or data or the writing or the research, whatever it is, you'll learn that there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And so just like with any tool, you know, there was, there was a time that people used to do accounting by hand on paper, and now we have spreadsheets. There was a time when you did design with a pencil. Now we have Adobe and all of Adobe's Illustrator tools and, and the entire Adobe suite. Um, so the, the way that I would think about it is the more, the more you understand what like high quality content looks like for you, for your brand, for your market, um, what it is that you need to produce, then that'll allow you to figure out the right way to use these tools to create what you need to create. And, and the tools will be very useful to you. The people who get in trouble are the ones who, um, you know, log into ChatGPT and say, write me a blog article about whatever. And it's like, okay, it's going to be an average of what's already been written on the web. It's going to be off brand, sound nothing like anything else that's been written on your website before. And the one thing we know for sure is Google does not need that content. Um, Google already has all of the information and ideas in that blog article that you used AI to create. That is absolutely the wrong way to use AI. But if you're using AI to help you uh, figure, help you be more creative and um, to test your ideas. Um, I showed an example of, you know, give me two dog training experts and write an interview where they disagree. That's awesome because there's going to be a lot of ideas that come out of that that are going to improve my marketing content. But the last thing I'm doing is asking you to write blog articles. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm with you. And I think it's not as simple as whether it's written by human or really whether it's written by AI, because you know there are humans that are not that great writers, right? So, and uh, uh, in my in my um, in, in our work, we have we have seen a lot of writing that is not even in any any better than AI. It's about okay, are you really uh, bringing anything new to the table? And what Google calls information gain. And I think you said it very well, Dale. Like you know, Google doesn't need you to tell it everything that it already knows, which is you know what AI is doing. They do, yeah. they want information on game, which is okay. Are you bringing something new to the table around this particular query? Are you bringing whether well, there's an opinion, or a, a firsthand experience, something, right? A different perspective, a different angle. That's what is important uh, to Google, and also to your audience. It's not again. That's the other thing. It's not all about Google. It's also about your audience, right? So are you giving your audience something new and something uh, exciting? I think that's very important for SGE because. Anything that is matter of factual or anything that is very short query, like um, I don't know, how to how to change a bulb or, or something very simple, you know, you're not going to be able to create content that's going to be um, that is going to be able to outrank uh, their own their own answers, uh, Google's own answers on SEV. So very important to think that you know for the future we need to start pr uh, producing more like editorial content, meaning anything that where where you're injecting a lot of your your own perspective, your own experience. So. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, that and I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Like as a, as a content writer, the one thing you have that nobody can really compete with is your personal experience. And you can extend that to your brand's experience or, um, or, or even whoever it is that you're interviewing their experience. But like, if you start there, then you'll, you'll, you'll have unique content and you'll have something interesting to tell. Absolutely. So, well, that's a great uh, way to end the, 
the webinar, Dale. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for attending and for tuning in. You'll get the recording. You'll get some more resources when everything is uh, is, is packed up nicely and edited and whatnot. And um, thanks again. So we'll have another amazing webinar coming in the next month. We have Garrett Sussman from, um, from iPod Rank. He's going to be talking about SGE. So we're going to keep diving deeper in SGE. So um, stay tuned for the invitation, uh, be in the lookout. We'll, we'll, we'll keep bringing in amazing uh, speakers. Remember, this is um, Carlos Mesa from Crowd Content. We helped you and um, brands, agencies, um, um, media publishers create amazing content. So thank you very much. And um, everybody have a great day. Bye, Dale. All right, bye-bye.